Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmette We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hello, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Art of Living Well podcast. Marnie and I are taking time this week to honor and celebrate the life of George Floyd. We are having conversations, reading, and educating ourselves, talking to our kids, and most importantly, listening to those who have experienced systemic racism for their entire lives. We encourage you all to do what you can in your own communities through donation, time, or resources to help create meaningful change. With that, we are beyond excited to introduce today's amazing guest, Princess Haley. Princess is an educator, a healer, and a community organizer. She focuses her efforts as a writer and speaker about possibility thinking, individual, social, and systemic change. Princess Haley is a Chicago refugee who has lived in North Minneapolis for 25 years where she has trained and served in the fields of education, employment, and violence prevention. She is a co-founder and director of Individual Giving at Appetite for Change, where her key role is to use food to connect people across communities. Princess believes that infinite possibilities are attainable through intentionality and cognitive restructuring. She is a founding member with the Environmental Justice Community Coalition, fostering African-American improvement in total health, and is the mayoral appointee to the Upper Harbor Terminal, CPC. Princess's passion and energy contributes to the growing landscape of health, wealth, and social change while creating a healthy foundation for lifelong learning. This is a powerful conversation that you won't want to miss. Princess opens up and shares her personal experiences and her insightful advice about how we can join together, evolve, and come back better than before. And with that, let's get started. Hi, Princess. Thank you so much for being on the Art of Living Well podcast today. We are thrilled to bring you on as a guest. Thank you for having me. I'm finding this is a good time to have narratives, share stories, shape history. So I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Um, Well, Can you start out by sharing with the audience a little bit about your background and your story that ultimately led you to where you are today? Okay, well, I am Princess Haley. I'm one of the founders. I always say your favorite founder from Appetite for Change, which is a nonprofit organization in North Minneapolis where we use food as a tool to create health, wealth, and social change. Um, Being a refugee from Chicago who led her own efforts and her own movement from the south to the north to Minnesota, not far, but looking for opportunities that were not for me in Chicago and looking for a different environment, a different flavor of water, a different type of air, a different type of access to the soil that I didn't see in that inner city led me to 25 Uh, years later, or maybe 18 years later, meeting with two phenomenal women, Latasha Powell, one of our founders, and Michelle Horvitz, our other founder, to talk about how do we organize people to find out how they feel about the foodscape in North Minneapolis, which to me resembles all of the food areas in Southside Chicago that I was trying to get away from. And what do people want to do about it? What do people dream to see be different? What change are they hungry for? Not what change are we hungry for? What answers do we have for them? Not what power can we give to them, but can we create a place where they can operate with their their own power? So now here we are 25 years later, and I'm a licensed teacher with the state of Minnesota. I've worked in the field of food justice, 
education, employment, and violence prevention, trying to um, create a space where people can be responsible for their own foods, be able to teach and know what education is about for their own children in their homes, and know that their health is their wealth, their food is their medicine, and also to create a space where it's okay for tears to flow and stories to be shared and healing to take place. That, that is so amazing. Like I have the chills right now. Um, I, it's truly, I mean, the work that you're doing is amazing. And um, I'm proud of you just listening to you talk about it. And I'm wondering, um, how do you specifically help the families and the children build these kind of healthy foundations for lifelong learning? Well, with an appetite for change, uh, I was the director of education when I started. I have um, my licenses, early childhood, urban education. So understanding that food comes with this narrative and you have to find out from people through experiences at the cutting boards, in the kitchens, in the soil, at the garden. You have to find out from them what they know about it. What do they call it? How do they define it? And what have they learned from their ancestors, their grandmothers, their mothers about growing and cooking their own food? And then you get to let them see what Webster or the dictionary or the prescribed definition of it is. And then you give them to create their own meaning based on what they want to see for the future of their children. And to me, that process is like my philosophy of lifelong learning, um, being able to, to experience something, describe it, then define it by popular definition, then seek your own definition and your own importance and value it within yourself before you can actually act. So um, that's how we do it, Appetite for Change, through community cooking events, through Appetite for Growing, through our youth training and opportunity program. We had a great collaboration some years ago with Northside Achievement Zone, where I was able to create a curriculum called Bite Sized Pieces of Healthy that connected snack foods to healthier versions of snack foods, like instead of just chocolate pudding, you can do an avocado pudding. I actually got that recipe from Sheila, the superwoman, um, St. James in North Minneapolis. And um, the babies did like the avocado pudding, but once they tasted the chocolate pudding out the package, um, you could see that it did something different in their bodies. And then connecting the the nutrients in the avocado to the brain development of young children, just being able to educate parents quickly, bite-sized pieces, bite-sized minutes of time, giving people a chance to dispel the myths. We do not, um, we have time to cook at home, eating plant-based. Is it more expensive? Meat is expensive. Beans and vegetables um, can replace my meat budget and just really getting people to see that there are other women of color, black women, who eat plant-based, who feel like it's their responsibility to teach their children, then they see it's possible. So it's something about that change happening individually within that person and them seeing other individuals do it that makes this social shift. And then eventually those community members come together to ask for systemic change from um, government entities. So that's the way we make sure that people are embarked on lifelong learning when it comes to their food and their health is their wealth. And then we use those spaces to talk about other issues like homelessness or economic deprivation or the education system or um, SROs in schools, just whatever the conversation is about after you've initiated how to look at what you already know, challenge what you already know, Think about your own truth and create a goal for yourself based on where you see your children's children's children being, then you can use that framework to talk about many different things. This is so powerful, everything that you're that you're saying and everything you're doing through Appetite for Change. You know, can you share maybe examples or a story how the work you're doing is creating positive change in the communities of North Minneapolis? 
I would love to. I just recently, I want to share her name. I'm going to share her name. Her name is Eva. I call her Queen Eva. Um, and she was a young lady who was uh, one of the first 400 people that we met with when we cooked and ate and talked and asked community members about the change that they wanted to see um, to get ideas that would shape the programming that we offer right now and Appetite for Change. They come from the heartbeat and the rhythm of Northsiders and people from Northeast as well. Um, so I remember sitting in the church, St. Olive Church, we would be in the basement cooking and eating and talking. And then we would be at Christ English Church or Redeemer Church. And I remember me and Eva having a conversation about growing food and her hair was done and her nails were done and she was so fly. But I mean, she could cook her butt off, like her food was so good. And, and she continued to come back to Community Cooks and then she started to volunteer with us when we didn't even have funding and she was pregnant. And she was like, we should run a new moms program. That's why we have a new moms program. Her and Cola or Nicole Powell were like pregnant at that time and Shakina Washington. So all three of these women were like pregnant at that time, but Shakina was more of a natural path. Um, and Nyree wasn't. And so we would talk about like why we grew food and why our hair was natural or why we, you know, looked for natural ways to reduce fevers at home before we ran to the emergency room with our child. And, and she was doing phenomenal things as a mom, like her son. Um, she was an avid parent in school with her son who um, was diagnosed with, I believe, um, autism. I hope I'm right. And so she was at the school, so she had the power and she was activating her power, but she just really didn't believe in like this food thing yet. And now Nairi's daughter is like running up to me at the farmer's market with a little bag of crab apples for sale. And she's running a CSA program. And I text her on Facebook the other day, like, Queen, your food already grown. She's like, yep, I started my ceilings in my house in January. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and she, I'm like, I just remember talking to you at Christ English about growing food and getting dirt under your nails. She said, and don't forget about natural hair. And now her hair is in locks. <laughs> so um, that is definitely a success story, I think, not of appetite for change, but of how her thought process and, and care for her son, which did not push her from um, her son's school, but it pushed her from the workplace. Like this woman left her job and fought with her job to give her time to be in her son's school, to show teachers how her son was to be communicated with and how he was to be educated. And this young man just graduated like top of his class and is the most beautiful young man I've ever met. But that thought process just had to replace food instead of your child's education. And Eva is just like, Queen Eva is just like the flyest person who's doing way more than I'm doing with food. I don't have to buy a CSA from her because I don't have time to get in the garden as much. But that's <laughs> one of the success stories that I think talks about that process in the beginning of just using your power, thinking lifelong learning, and switching it to other areas of your life. That's, that's an awesome story. I mean, that's so beautiful. I love that. Um, changing gears a little bit and getting a little more personal with you, I'm wondering how does being Black in Minnesota affect your ability to live and to live well, if it does at all? Um, I didn't know, and I've said this before, like all y'all questions are things that I say to people and they're like, huh? So I was grateful that you, you were even courageous enough to have these questions, but when I came to Minnesota, I got off of Amtrak and I didn't know where I was going and I didn't know anybody here. And I asked the police, it, you know, where, where can I go? Um, I had two little babies, one in my stomach, one barely walking and a backpack full of clothes. And I went to the Dorothy Day shelter. And when I looked for housing, um, we were looking for apartments in St. Paul until my worker realized that I was from Chicago. 
And when she realized that I was from Chicago, she told me I should move to North Minneapolis. And not knowing, I was trying to get away from Chicago. I didn't want to go live around a whole bunch of people who um, were pained and torn by the war that we endure every day in Chicago on the streets. Um, my son was shot and killed. You know, I lost my baby in North Minneapolis. Um, I, I didn't want to live there. So I didn't know anything about redlining. Um, I was greeted by white people and different colors of people who wanted to build community and play hand games. But at the same time, I didn't know that this is what black meant when America said black. I didn't know black meant less than. I was raised as a princess in the projects in the city of Chicago um, with uh, an air about myself and some privilege to go to the museum every day. Like my family was, I guess we were poor, but I didn't see it. I had my basic needs met probably above and beyond being the only child for 10 years. It wasn't a strain on my family. So growing up as a princess in Chicago, having access to museums like every day after school and my mom being home to cook meals and brushing my teeth and brushing my hair a hundred strokes and having black mailmen and black teachers and um, black police officers, I didn't know. I thought Hollywood was in California. So when they told me stories of Bridgeport where we couldn't go, because of the Irish community was, it was said that they would kill black people. I thought that was by, in California. So it's funny how a young person constructs the world in their mind, but I didn't know that black meant less than. I didn't know that black meant no voice. I didn't know that black meant you wait. I didn't know that black meant you can't live over here until I came to Minnesota. And I've, I've shared that story um, looking for a space to say, help me sort this out, and how it impacts my well-being is that I often feel like I have to be, I can't be in the forefront of my feelings or my movement or my beliefs about even sometimes being called my name. Um, my daughter has had to fight with her schools, like, no, my name is Princess Anne, and if I can accept my friends, who change their names with their genders, and can you just accept me as a black young lady who has not had any changes, and we have to be, you know, her name is way too long, or why is it princess? Is that the title? And Anne is her name. It's like, no. To say that when people say, hey, guys, like, I'm not a guy. I'm, I'm a girl. So they, people, you know, this generalization. I remember when we read books and he was to represent both male and female, like women weren't important enough to be um, stated as well. Like they just couldn't type the extra letter or something. And now I can stand behind and with my peers who are gender nonconforming and say that's not how I identify. They say they get to say how they identify and people will call them accordingly. So coming to Minnesota and it creates a, what it creates is a, a voiceless place. And I've said this to like other people I've worked with, like it makes me say I'm sorry a lot. And I don't even believe in the word I'm sorry. I find myself not sharing when I know I have solutions or uh, questions it pushes the voice out of me. It makes me feel unimportant. And then afterwards, honestly, I think I take it out on my family um, because I've, I've heard myself saying to them, y'all don't listen to me just like those people at XYZ place or y'all don't listen to me just like when I'm at this meeting, you know, um, I feel so unimportant, but go ahead, do what you want to do. Don't ask me, don't ask for my opinion. And I'm like, that's not the truth in my home. That's the truth out in the community abroad, but I'm, because I don't feel like I can tell them, listen to me, hear me too, um, it, it, I take it out at home. And it also grows, um, it grows this feeling of not enoughness. I call them NEs um, within the work that I do at Standard Edition Women. And when people are operating from lack and feel like they are not enough, they usually add things to their life which take away. They add alcohol, 
they add other drugs, they add uh, gambling or sex or um, hair weave or contact lenses, something that totally takes away from your identity and who you are when you feel like you're not enough. And even you like asking me this, I feel like I'm like, I feel like people are going to hear me and say, that doesn't do all that. But I've had these conversations before you ask this question and I've sat reflectively with myself, like, why are you tripping with your family? They hear you. You run stuff at home. Like, they hear you. They have to. You're the princess in the house. You're the queen, mama, princess. Your husband loves you. Your children love you. Like, why do you think they don't hear you? Like, take it to really where it's happening at. So how many times are other people going through stuff in the streets at their jobs or at childcare or at school? What are our babies going through where they come home and they only have voice or they come in their communities? And we take it out on each other. Um, so there is a, a ailment towards it. And I've had to talk to individuals. And then I have to, I have to educate the person that discomforts me. Um, I can't bring it up as a group issue. I have to talk to a person individually. So like Shange says um, in the poem, in her choreo poem, the lady from Chicago, the brown lady, she says, can the girl from Chicago be heard and can she be handled warmly? And when I'm not handled warmly, I have to handle people warmly, even in my pain. So to carry that is extra, like, sometimes I don't even feel like they deserve it. I feel like they deserve to hear me wild out the way my family do, but I handle them warmly because I want to model what I um, expect. I want to model reciprocity and truth, justice, and reciprocity, like the the beliefs in my eye. And that's just how I have to do it. Wow. Princess, that was, that, thank you, I guess, for being so vulnerable and sharing all that with us. I mean, I, I'm just still being very moved by everything you talked about from your childhood and growing up in Chicago and moving to Minneapolis and everything you've gone through and just the, the voice that you haven't been able to, to have. Um, and I think a lot of us are realizing that right now and really trying to do the work to empathize and understand exactly what, what a lot of black people have been going through for years and it hasn't been talked about. Um, and kind of on that note, a lot of, a lot of white people seem to be avoid talking about race because they fear being seen as preju prejudice and then they adopt strategic color blindness instead. And many feel that they lack the skills and they don't know how to have difficult conversations or really what to say. How would you advise others who are uncomfortable having these race conversations to engage in meaningful dialogue and be able to express support? Um, I would recommend uh, it's, and it, this is, I can, I can repeat this over and over again. And I'm sure a lot of us have hit our heads and just haven't really noticed that we're in, in a shift. But the gift is that I don't see really content. I see structure and framework. And so when we wrote the, our educational philosophy of this engagement experiencing with people, come out and cook with us, not as a volunteer, come out and cook with us and get in the garden, not as somebody from another community who lives in a different zip code and has a different socioeconomic status and checks a different box, but come and cook and eat with us as a human that's trying to get a basic need met and allow those conversations to organically happen. And if you're not cooking and eating and talking with people or growing and eating and talking, growing, you can grow and eat. That's what I do with Oak Ground, even Washa. But growing and eating and talking with people, then we have to ask those questions first. Like, before you feel like you're racist, like, what does racism even mean to the person who's saying you're racist? Like, if somebody, I've been told I'm racist. Like, princess, you can't say that. That's racist. And I'm like, what is that? What does racism mean? What does racism mean? I can easily fight against what you're saying when I don't even know what you're talking about. The English language is so complex. I think we have, what, 24 letters, 26 letters. I haven't taught in a while. And don't charge it to the heart, charge it to my head. But how many ever letters we got? We have 72 units of sound. 
So words can mean different things to different people. When people say they get their master gardener's license, I don't have my master's degree because I'm not comfortable with the word master. Mm -hmm. So things mean different things to different people. But to ask questions, to go as a blank slate, not knowing that knowing that you don't even know what you don't even know. What does that mean to that person? And knowing that if you just ask that one question to 20 different black people, they're going to tell you their races is something different. Um, And then let them know what you think it means. And then you seek the definition from Webster or Google or what has been prescribed as this define way to define this word. It's almost like religion, like we all see God as different. We all see our creator as different. We all have a different relationship with him. Prayer means something different to everybody. And this injustice means something different to everybody. So then you can decide what races and racism means to you based on your desire a result for your children. I saw um, um, a little girl bringing stuff with her and I'm a teacher in the family. So I'm like, let me help her. Oh, I just see a baby. I just melt. I don't care what color they are. I just turn into a pile of butter. And she hid behind her dad and, and instantly I thought this child hasn't been around me like people. That's me with my bias. I was proved wrong instantly because as soon as her dad handed full of stuff to my husband, the little girl handed my husband her bag too and stood next to him. Maybe it was just that she should be afraid of strangers. She's never seen me before. And she had to watch her dad, you know, interact with a person before she was comfortable. But you have to put yourself in a place where you have a, a, a open space. Uh, to be, lifelong learning is about how containers we're all full cups from our trauma our individual trauma our stories we haven't been able to share but when you go into engaging with other people you might have to sit home first and pour a little bit out recognize something you've seen recognize somewhere where somebody's treated you wrong I was in the parkway and my brakes were going out And as I rolled the parkway, it was because I felt like not a lot of traffic's on the parkway and I could do rolling stops so that I didn't continue to grind out my rotors on the way to the shop. And this woman stopped and said, that's a stop sign. I'm sure her truth in that story is that I was going to run her over. If she went home, she probably said, this black girl in this police car, this Crown Victoria almost ran me over. Just like my truth was, this white woman eluded her privilege and immediately became the policeman to tell me I couldn't do a rolling stop when both of our truths were just truths and neither of them were facts. We would have to come together to come up with a fact. I would have to share my story so when you have those fast interactions with people, you have to pour those out how you feel like after you're you're, um, impacted, like Octave says, it changes the thing that's constant, and we shape, we're shaped by change. Every person that I meet, I'm changed by, and they are changed by me. So even in that transactional experience, that woman the hands of a black woman in a black car. That white woman eluded her power over and privilege over and doesn't even know I'm in a situation. This is an emergency. Like when I ran every stop sign to where my son lay dead and shot. People didn't know. So we have to meet those cashiers at, at, at grocery stores and see our neighbors who buzz by. And even though we've dropped something and don't help us pick it up, we have to see them with a question mark. We can't see them with a period or an exclamation point. We have to see them because we don't know what, where they're coming from and what truth they're holding. We have to be open to ask questions, challenge our own beliefs, and really think about what we want to see for the future. I always wonder, did my great-great-grandmother put any intention behind me? Was there any space in her life for her to say, I want my look like this? Yes, Martin Luther.
So King said one day he wants all of us to be able to hold hands and be in community with each other, excuse me, with each other. But did our families say they wanted that because that's where the work has to happen? Because when that daddy modeled handing that stuff to my husband, he said to that little girl, we were okay. I already saw the little girl as somebody who wasn't around black people and was afraid of me. She look at her. She's afraid of black people. So you got to challenge your own thoughts and beliefs. And I could challenge mine for mine. I could hold me accountable for mine. That's why I always share a story first where I know I was wrong to model for people. It's okay not to be okay. And sometimes you will be wrong. Mm -hmm. That is such great and powerful advice. So, and, 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 yeah, I, I was just going to say, so what I'm really hearing from you is that the, in your mind, the way that we can kind of have these difficult conversations is to actually have conversations mm -hmm. over a meal or um, spending time together and just asking each other questions and really trying to understand each other's perspectives. My, am I saying that right? You're saying it exactly right. I think the cutting board and the garden creates a, a what, I, what I've found is it creates a very vulnerable space where you're just trying to get the food made. And then you become family with people you don't know, with strangers. Like if you and I were at a community cooks event and we meet up at the table because I know I got a bomb cornbread recipe and you know you got a bomb cornbread recipe but Appetite for Change has given us this cornbread recipe. We're already sisters. We have an affinity for cornbread. Now we're going to learn how to make cornbread without my stick of butter, because that's not the healthiest way. We're going to learn how to make cornbread without your cup of sugar. They're going to teach us how to make cornbread without my Jiffy box. They're going to teach us how to make cornbread from scratch. We're going to use agave as a sweetener because it gives you um, a lower glycemic index for people who may have diabetes and other health-related issues. And now when somebody yells out, who made the cornbread? We're high-fiving. And we never talked about racism. Uh -huh. We engage. We found a common connection. We see that we're more alike than different. Uh -huh. I talk about it in my TED Talk. We're more alike than different at the cutting board because we're trying to meet a basic need. We want to feed people some good cornbread. You do not want to be my teammate making the strawberry rhubarb cobbler because I'm going to mess it up because I don't make pies. So I'm not going to go to that area. But those two bakers, that one Hmong woman who bakes and that black elder who bakes, and they're both like four feet tall, they're going to not speak the same language. And that young, that granddaughter is going to help translate. And when they're reading the recipe and it says nine and a half in saucepan and the Hmong elders like shrugging our shoulders and the black ladies like nine and a half inches. Like, how do you find the circumference? And then they both say a skillet. They're going to find out they're more alike than different. Oh, I, That's what cooking does. Are right on cooking, eating and talking, growing, eating and talking. That's where you find you're more alike than different. Uh -huh. I, I, I just love what you're saying. I was thinking the same thing before you started talking about finding the commonalities and we have to stop making assumptions and, and judgments about each other, which is what you were, what you, what you were getting at. And, you know, and how can we do that more? How can we create the opportunity to have those conversations? You have to create the, well, Appetite for Change had the opportunity now with social distancing we're finding that we can only comfortably um, engage in social distancing efforts in the garden. It's harder to cook and eat and talk and be close when you're, you're not supposed to be around people because of COVID-19. Um, but I, I have found also that these are some of the same conversations people are having when they're building houses for Habitat for Humanity, yeah. which that's another basic need us having roofs over our heads. Maybe we can find some conversations around, um, I'm sure people have been having courageous conversations around sewing masks, because that's another basic need. Um, I've met some of the coolest women foraging up in the Eloise Butler flower garden and learned a lot, because I'm looking for medicine and they are too. And that's a common basic need. We want our health to be our wealth. And none of us believed in or didn't fully believe in doctors as our only way to heal ourselves. 
so we were able to meet there. And we just look for those similarities. It's not something, because as soon as you say the buzzword, black, white, racism, prejudice, injustice, death, it's a trigger for those people who've been impacted. If the common narrative is, and I agree with it, but I give the common narrative because I say none of, none of what I say is 100% true for everyone. It might be different from some people. It was different for the young man who was my Uber driver from somewhere in North Minnesota. I can't say where, but he said his friend was shot in the chest in his doorway. And his other friend is doing life in jail for being pulled over with pounds of marijuana. He said in the year that Minneapolis was named murder Apples, there was more killings in his community than Minneapolis. This was a white young man. So when I say if the narrative is true that black people are um, being shot at alarming rates by police officers, which I agree with, that might be different for that young man because I met him. Um, then I already know the truth. And if you're a white person and I'm talking to you, then there's so much underlying that I'm putting on you by saying that. So if we have these conversations around these words, there's so much to interpretation and perception and perspective that has to be sorted through. We're too far down the line to sort through. But what's powerful is, remember, my, my theory is you first have to experience each other. Mm-hmm. Then when you experience each other, you walk away going, oh, I guess Princess Blacks are kind of cool. Like, you know, or... Hey, Courtney, Courtney does shit. Like, I love Courtney. If I sat with negative preconceptions about white women, I would have never met Courtney. I would have never met Suzanne. I would have never met Michelle on November 11, 2011. What a divine day to meet a woman, to talk about starting an organization and helping the foodscape in North Minneapolis. I would have never met him if I sat in Chicago with all white women or races as the, the thought in my mind. So we have to experience each other first. Mm-hmm. And I think the safe spaces to experience is when we're meeting those basic needs. Right now, people are organizing because our safety is compromised. Mm-hmm. When there's fear and your safety is compromised, people come together. Food, people come together. Housing, people come together. Basic needs. Not my Louis Vuitton bag or my Kate Spade purse. We're not going to come together. We're going to compete. Mm-hmm. We're going to see who's better. You're going to tell me how many more people you know. You know, I know this person and this person and that person. Um, And they work here. You're going to qualify yourself to me. When I don't want to know who you grew up to be, I want to know who you came here being. Mm -hmm. I want to meet your human being. I don't want to meet your human that you're doing. That's, I I absolutely love that. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I hope that, that's the way that more people are going to start behaving and um, coming together. Like you said, as, as there's a, was a safety issue and trying to, people are, we're starting to see people coming together more to try and meet the basic needs. And I think that the experiences have been very powerful for a lot of people. And I hope that, we can continue to have these comings together, if you will, um, as you know, the days, weeks, and years go on. I'm wondering um, right now we're you know we're having this platform, and we'd love to know you know what what you want to say, who you want to address with everything going on right now. I want to, are we talking about the most recent trauma and loss of black life that has been publicized? Yes. Because if that's what we're talking about, my heart first and foremost goes out to women as mother. Not just mothers who birth children, because there's a whole population of women who have carried in their womb or whose womb are barren, but they have parented, they have mothered children. They have invested into the seed that sprang up from another woman, or they have invested into a seed that they get to watch die with dreams and hopes and possibilities. And then there are women 
like me who get to birth bare seed um, in good soil or repot to put in good soil and 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 we don't get to reap the harvest there is a healing there's a grieving that we don't get to publicly do because we're just supposed to be okay and they're in a better place and i often ask people how do you know what place they're in and can i send you to see them because the cliches have no place during this time. If you don't know what to say, the first thing is to acknowledge you don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost a child and I still don't know what to say. But there's a power in the ministry of just your presence and your social connectedness when a person's dealing with that loss that gives them a space to just be and not do. As mothers, we don't often get that. I am not discounting fathers. I just cannot speak from the narrative of a father who's lost a child. They have not opened up and had enough courageous conversations with me yet. Um, so that public healing, we don't get a chance to do. When I heard this happened, the, and I couldn't watch the video, I stopped watching TV, um, avidly and didn't have a TV in my home since 9-11. My birthday is 9-11. So I was, I was that celebrating my birth was taken from me by everybody following the propaganda of gas is going to be $5 tomorrow. And nobody looked back the next day and noticed the gas was not $5 the next day. So that, that propaganda, I stay away from it. But I didn't watch the video. But when I heard it happen, my heart dropped for his mother. And we don't have a public place, not even in our home, to grieve because our family wants to see us be okay. And our jobs want us to be okay. And we have to give ourselves safe spaces and create community with other women who've lost and not be okay. Because there's a public healing of the heart. But there's a spiritual healing that has to take place of the womb. Which makes me think that all of us can meet in the womb of the earth, which is where the soil, the dirt, that's where life springs from and originates. Other than our womb, it's that womb. So that healing has to take place, but we have to acknowledge that we're wounded in the womb. And women have been comfortable enough to come to me and say, what happened to your girly parts after you lost your son? Like... And I remembered my cycle started two weeks early and it didn't end. And it came every two weeks for years after. And women shared that they had just profuse sweating from that area or what's going on in our wombs then when our children transition. Publicly, I have to say that um, just about the spiritual need behind mothers, women as mothers, not just mothers, to heal and acknowledge our losses and grieve openly or inwardly about them. And there's, that's just my area of expertise. My daughter might say something different as a 15-year-old. My husband might say something different as a Black man who was uncomfortable when we walked in Target and the police officer followed us in only to say, you all should close the store because rioters are coming. But he was on edge just because the police was behind us. Mm -hmm. That type of interaction with a person and energy he had to receive and he's holding my hand tight and I'm like, baby, what's wrong? And he's sweating, he even took his glasses and his mask off. Like, I can't, uh, 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 it's hard for me to breathe in his mask. Uh, um, it would be different if it came from him. My other request would be for us to be intentional with what we speak. Um, I don't agree with chanting, I can't breathe. America has seen us hang from trees and they've barbecued beneath us and publicized those photos on Wikipedia. Um, the most one that touches me is the one where the woman is hanging and her fetus is hanging from her womb. Um, and the story of the baby where her husband 
was accused of something and they lynched his friends and he escaped the lynching and she was trying to get him to Chicago, closer to Ida B. Wills, and they caught her and burned her. And when her baby fell out of her womb, they beat its head. So we've seen enough negativity. We have to be intentional with the words we can breathe. We will breathe. Um, so I think just some of our, our things that we profess out into the future that come out of our mouth, we have to speak our future life. I'll just end with that. We have to speak it life. We have to speak it life um, because that's how things manifest. First, they manifest as a thought. Thoughts become things, and then they come out of our mouth and speak them. So we have to speak that we will breathe. Um, I'm not taking anything away from people who chant, I can't breathe, but I do see some power being behind. We will breathe. Our sons will breathe. My son will graduate. I remember somebody came to visit me after Anthony passed, and they said, how's Jesse doing? I said, he's in school, and he came upstairs and was like, Ma, you got a swisher? Because we smoked weed after the death of his brother. And I was like, boy, ask me for no swisher. And they was like, I thought you said he was in school. And I said, I'm trying to speak it into existence. He graduated. The next week he was in school. He went to Paladin in Northtown. And he graduated. So we got to speak what we want to see. Mm -hmm. I love that advice of how you're reframing it a bit um, just to be positive and future looking. Um, that we can breathe, we will breathe. I think that's very powerful. And I think you're absolutely right that you have to speak the life you want to manifest. I mean, Stephanie and I both personally believe that so strongly. And, you know, the idea of saying we will breathe, we will live, all of that is so true and so amazing. I would, I would love to see people doing that more. And, you know, there's a lot of people right now that, that want to help, and there are a lot of people that are helping um, in Minneapolis and, and all around the country, right? As far as donating time, supplies, money, you know, you have the community gardens and, and educating themselves, because that's really where some of the hard work takes place, right? Um, any advice you have on what people can do to help? Advice on what people can do to help. I know we have um, identified that before COVID-19, we had food access issues in urban areas. We organized with youth all across America. Then we had COVID-19 and people are like, what is that protective change gonna be able to do about COVID-19? And we're like, we still gotta get real food to real people. And then the most recently publicized loss of black life, because there's been more since then, they just haven't been publicized. Um, they're like, well, what are y'all going to do? We still have to get real. And the blacks have been not safe. So how do we go to these gardens? How do we get groceries and food to our community? With COVID, the, the shelves were empty of ramen noodles and canned goods. How do we get seeds to people and grow kits so they can grow food on their own porch in case there is an initiation of long-term in-house curfew or um, what do we quarantine? What we had to do with COVID to the point where you can come off your porch and pick that tomato and that cucumber and a few pieces of spinach and go in the house and eat. Um, I know there's been efforts of donations of food non-perishables, but then there are some people who found holes tapped in the tops of the water bottles. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm torn and concerned. And I think this podcast, you asked for the real me because the appetite for change me would say, oh, we're gonna be doing donating food efforts and you can drop off donations at the US Bank Stadium and connect with Felicia at the West Broadway Coalition because she knows where all of the donations are being accepted up and down West Broadway and um, connect with a, uh, a religious leader or a church. Like I'm sure everybody has their efforts, but then I really want to say, um, oh yes. And you can, you can go to our website, www.ascmn.org. And if you donate 
Like a lot of people in the black community think that their dollar doesn't count. But $3.33 a month would be one shift for a young person off the streets for four hours. That's how we pay our youth. If you donated $100 a month, that would be 20 meals for 20 or 20 meals for families, you know, for that $100. And there's other organizations that are doing great work. Megazine needs help. Um, we were connected with those young people over there, uh, and their foundation was torn down. Juxtaposition has been impacted. So places for rebuilding efforts. Um, and that's the real me. The real me sees this as a global issue and, and it's bare minimum. Remember I say individually change has to happen. Individually, people are going to need food. They're going to be able to need to source food their sales just in case people who want to donate their time, talent, and resources can't come out. And then socially, they need to be able to create a structure and a system where they can um, play their village role at giving as well as receiving. And then systemically, all of these organizations who are delivering services will need funds to rebuild and we'll need funds to continue to serve. Right now we're engaging volunteers. I'm hosting a volunteer orientation every Monday through Zoom. And we're looking for people who can grow. If we um, finish up this opportunity to get these food, non-perishable food items, safe non-perishable food items donated, we do wanna distribute them. So we'll need volunteers to help with bagging up and distributing that. Um, we're also looking for people to help collect stories and shape narrative. Like I feel like the young people are kind of being bypassed right now. They have such a story to share because right now, this is the history that they're going to teach about. They're not happy with the way schools teach history. This is the history that schools are going to teach back, teach about if the school systems come back online in the future that their children are going to learn about. They're going to be the elders sitting in the room saying, that's not what happened. Or they can write the history now. And that's just an idea project that I feel like some volunteers could work on. I know we have maybe um, 12 youth in our youth program right now. And outside of being in the garden, that's where the youth are loving to be right now because they feel healing in the land. Um, but we have not done any community organizing efforts around shaping the narrative since COVID or shaping the narrative since George Floyd's loss of life. Thank yeah. you. That's very helpful. And we're going to link up a lot of what you said in the show notes so people have these resources, to, you know, to be able to help. Um, but I think it all, it, it, it all comes from in addition to the, you know, the, the donations and the goods, I think, like you said, it's having those conversations and um, ha having the dialogue and just being open and honest so that we can all come to a common, a common place and a common understanding. And that's where a lot of the, the work can take place. And you also mentioned um, earlier when we were chatting that you, are you still looking for people to um, help plant in the garden? We are. I have recently been connected by one of our new board members um, to Hands On Minnesota or Hands On. Am I saying it wrong? Hands On. I think my TBI is kicking in. I've done great, though. Like, usually I stumble over words and everything. And the fog <laughs> kicks in. But I believe it's Hands On Minnesota. And also there's another organization that may come through with um a group of 40 or 50 volunteers. The importance about engaging volunteers though, is again, we want people to come as learner and teacher mm -hmm. and be able to understand that there's no right way. There's not one right way. My mother would say to me, we're all made in the image of God. And this is why I love Octavia Butler because she has so many questions and she thought so much about religion when she talked in the story of the parable of the sower that she came up with her own ideas. But I would often say, we all look too different to all look like the creator. But I believe it's that we're all made in his image because we all have the ability to do what God does and that's create. We can create. Um, so there's more than one right way. It's not a one size, one size fits all. 
um, even when you're looking for equality or equity. You know, they give everybody that one size box. It doesn't fit everybody. It doesn't get everybody to sing over the fence. When they show that visualization, you have to tailor what you what you have to offer. And so I'm looking to build community with community members um, through the Zoom calls and, and, and find out what do they feel about, um, what does their name mean? And what did they eat for dinner last night? This is what our volunteer orientation is like. You know, it's not about what time can you be there. Like, those are the logistics, but we're really trying to build community. We just want to be family. Because if we were all seen as family and we connected in that deeper kind of way, then I would feel you when you hurt without you even telling me you were hurting. You've done it. And all the listeners have done it. You've walked past someone and looked in their eyes and have been able to feel their pain without having any true empathic gifts. And that's when you care. That's when you're family. And we try to have an experience for our volunteers to um, do that with each other. And then we meet up in the garden. And then that's when the conversations take place. So, yes, we are looking for people, but I want people to know kind of what that experience is going to be like. It's not going to be the traditional. You go to Mary Jo and you put on a hairnet and some gloves and you serve soup and smile. (laughs) And I've been on both sides of that table for years. Me and my children ate at Mary Jo's and went to Mary Jo's for food, chef and hygiene and clothes. And then I've been on the side where I can donate my time and my talent. But it was for me, it was about having conversations with the people. How did you get here? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. Nobody ever asked me that. They didn't know I was a struggling in school for teaching and working at the Minneapolis Urban League, but just still couldn't make ends meet. So me and my kids ate at Mary Jo's and came to get toilet paper and diapers and bed sets. They didn't know. Nobody ever asked me. And they felt good doing that. So our volunteer experience will be more about being family and building community. And if people are welcome to come, you can go to our website, www.afcmn.org, and go to the bottom partner with us. Click volunteer, fill out the form, and I'll be the person that you get in contact with. Well, I personally um, am going to do that today because I would love to come join you guys to build community, build family. It sounds wonderful. Yes. Marnie and I have talked about this before, and now this is going to be the catalyst for us actually taking some action. So, Yep. And I'd love – I don't know if you – um, have children that come down and volunteer, but I'd love to have my children get involved as well. Yes, you know we make space for the children. I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> awesome. So, well, um, Princess, as we as we wrap up this conversation, we we always like to ask all of our guests, "What does the art of living well mean to you?" Um, and there's no right or wrong answer, of course. The art of living well means something different for every generation. So I think people have to find what it means for them. For me, it means and has always meant what I call my personal liberation plan. Jesse, my oldest son, that one who boycotted Black history, always freedom wasn't free. And I didn't believe him, but now I do. So my personal liberation plan, which is the art of living well, is me acknowledging every system outside of me that impacts my life. Right now, those systems are the medical system, the education system, the employment system, the food system, and the law enforcement. Overall, Living well means me identifying where I have power that I can elude and allowing food to be my medicine. The absence of some things to be my medicine. The addition to some things being my medicine, like breathing deeper will help me with my headaches. Vitamin B will help me with my headaches. When I go see my doctor, he'll give me Tylenol. So I have to go see my doctor too, but I have some power within that. 
he doesn't have 100% power. I have 50% power and he has 50% power because he has the EKG machine and he can tell me if this TBI is leading to epilepsy or why am I having these severe headaches. But when I'm home and I can't reach him because now the truth in reality is I can only get a, a video call with my doctor. He can't check my heart rate. He can't look in my ears or my eyes. So I have to be able to have some power in understanding how I feel. With the education system, it's about educating and sharing a narrative and sharing a truth and our children digesting and remembering this information and being able to repeat it. Um, and I would like more for my daughter to be able to think and come up with alternative solutions. I feel like so much of our responses to some things are just programmed in. Um, my son was murdered. He laid on a block on 28th and Fremont, right across the street from where Appetite for Change has a beautiful garden. And I ran through the yellow tape. And after I ran through the yellow tape, everybody listening can guess what happened. Same thing that happens on the TV shows. You see the black mother runs through the tape, the police grab her, they throw her on the ground. They didn't throw me on the ground, they threw my son on the ground. They pushed me back. And I had to step outside and say, why did I have run through the yellow tape? Because it had been programmed into my mind from watching TV shows. So to be able to stop and think, I was able to leave that yellow tape and walk the perimeter and find where my son really lay to calm my mind and see that it was him. But everybody else was just stuck in that one little spot. And that's what education does, I believe. I think we have to birth thinkers. So that's living well when I can think and when I can solve my own problems that are related to my health. When I can be able to build my own business and work my job, that's the art of living well. When I can grow part of my food and can and blanch and freeze the produce that I grow to help me make it through the winter, that's the art of living well. When I can build or erect a structure that I can live in just because I bought a piece of land and be able to keep a roof over my head, that's the art of living well. When I can see that my consuming of um, goods that are mass produced and sold to everybody to put me in competition with other women. I can also go inside my bucket of materials and sew and make my own clothes. I have people like, oh, princess, make me one of them. That's cute. That's the art of living well, being able to create. And then the last is to be able to protect everything I've worked so hard to do and build, um, not depending on the system to protect me, because some people believe um, that I can do whatever I want to do to you, and by the time the police come, I'll be gone. So how do I protect my home where I've grown my food, sold my clothes, built my business, taught my daughter to think we have to be able to protect it? To me, that's my personal liberation, and that's the art of living well. That is so beautiful, Princess. Thank you for sharing all of that. I and we, we love asking this question, but this one was really powerful. Your response was so beautiful and powerful. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. and thank you so much for being on the show today and having honest conversation with us. I hope that you feel like you could share your voice in the way that you wanted to share your voice. That's our goal. And we just really appreciate, um, admire, respect everything you're doing. It's amazing. And um, I'm very moved. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this time. Like I said, that one question you asked, I've been trying to find a place to stick that in. And sometimes I say it to my peers and they're like, okay, what was number four? And they just go back to the agenda. So now that we're off script and off the agenda and the world is not regular, let's pray for it to come back better. Let's use our energy for it to come back different and changed. Um, and maybe stop expecting for it to just go back to normal. I didn't like normal. Normal wasn't comfortable for a lot of people. Um, so let's just grow. We have to evolve. Evolution is, is, is infinite and, and you can't avoid it. So thank you. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in person. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs>
Bye, princess. After social distancing and everything, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. In the garden. We'll see you in the garden. Yes. Oh, in the garden. Yes, you did say you were going to volunteer. So I look forward to getting your connection form. Okay. Have a good day. All right. Peace. Bye-bye. Peace. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.